Hello everyone, welcome to this financial risk management webinar. We are looking at module one and the topic is risk evaluation. Now, risk evaluation is the last step within that risk assessment process. So ideally we've identified the risk, we have analyzed this risk, so we have looked at its impact. And now what we want to do is to prioritize this risk. Now, as we start, uh, I have a quiz here for you. Which table used to construct a risk rating matrix is most likely to be unique for each organization? Is it the likelihood table? Is it the consequence table? Is it the risk appetite table or the risk rating table? So take a minute and uh, uh, think about this and then I'll share the answer with you. So the correct answer there is consequence table. And what we are saying is likelihood for all organizations will generally be the same. So when you say there is a, it's almost certain, it doesn't matter the size of the organization, it generally means 90, 95% chance of something happening. When it comes to consequence, however, you will find that uh, organizations are of different sizes. And so as an example, the dollar impact to an organization, as a very small organization, you might find that 100,000 Australian dollars has a very big impact. Whereas that has minimal impact to a company like Rio Tinto. And so it's the consequence table that is likely tailored to the organization. Now, in risk evaluation, what we do is we assess based on likelihood of occurrence, and we also look at the impact or consequence. So we may have a risk, and the question is, how likely is this risk to occur? And if it occurs, what is the consequence of this risk? And so we, 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 we bring those two together to actually rate that risk. Now, I must say that uh, it, it looks like it's quite straightforward, but it can actually be very subjective. Uh, and the other thing is uh, what you need to know is the significance of the rating determines the action or priority. So as an example, if after prioritizing the risk, that risk comes to say extreme, which is the highest level of risk, as an example, what will happen is then you will need to put actions in place or controls in place to mitigate that risk. So this is the, uh, risk, the risk likelihood table. And you can see we have rare, we have unlikely, we have possible, we have likely and almost certain. So when you look at a particular risk, so for example, what is the likelihood that this organization will, um, will be impacted by cyber attacks? Most of the time you will find that most organizations will actually rate that as either likely or almost certain. Very unlikely to say rare, unless the organization has no digital assets, and no data, which is again, probably not possible. The other thing uh, we look at is the consequence table. Now the consequence table defines the dollar terms, what's the impact. And so as an example, we can refer to a consequence as insignificant. If let's say in this particular organization, if it costs less than 50,000, if the impact is less than 50,000, now, this is a pretty small or medium-sized organization. And so you can see a minor consequence is something that is between 50 and 100,000. And what is catastrophic to this organization, it can cause this organization to collapse, is any loss that is over a million Australian dollars. So remember, this consequence table may fit that organization. But if you try to apply this consequence table to a company like Rio Tinto, this would not be ideal. A million dollars at Rio Tinto is very little uh, money, has very little consequence to that organization. Now, another way that uh, you can look at uh, consequence and likelihood and the impact of a risk is really looking at its impact on, say, profitability, on return on assets and the like. This is an example from the study guide, and this is figure 1.12. And here we are talking about variable rate. So uh, you may have a borrowing, and let's say the, the likely, the expected rate is 4%, but it fluctuates depending, obviously, on whether uh, the, the interest rate increases or decreases. And so if, for example, the, uh, the RBA raises the cash rate, you might find that the interest might move to, say, 6%. And so this is what we are saying, that if the interest rate on that borrowing increases, that will result in a loss. And so 
in addition to the 4% or in, the, in addition to the expected interest expense, you will actually incur an additional 100,000 or 200,000 if that increases by 6%. And you could also incur up to 400,000 in addition to the expected interest expense. Now that has a significant impact on your bottom line, on profitability. The reverse is also true. If the interest rate decreases, so let's say it decreases to 2%, then you have a gain of 200,000. And so, and that goes on. And so you have the gain or you have the loss. And this ties in very well with what I was saying that a risk can, has a, can have a positive uh, in, uh, impact or a negative impact. So it can be favorable or unfavorable. Now to try and translate this, you can use this uh, table here and you can see this organization, its earnings before interest expense was 1.4 million. And you can see this is equal all across because that's the earning. But look, if the interest expense moves or, or shifts, what will happen is if, if it's 2%, it will be 200,000. That's going to be the interest expense. And so the earnings after interest expense, in this case, is 1.2. If that increases to 400,000, then that becomes a million. And so you can see the, the earnings after interest expense is actually reducing as the interest expense increases. Now, note also that the return on assets is also reducing. So as interest expense increases, the return on that particular asset is also decreasing. Now, this is a very good uh, payoff diagram or payoff profile because it shows you the impact on return on assets. And, and what you'll find in most organizations is they will have a, a level of profitability where uh, the employees start, start earning a bonus. So if, if, if this organization does so well, then that's a bonus level. Now, what, what, what in this particular organization, what they have done or in this payoff, they have actually tied this to the interest expense and they are saying they are showing the impact the interest expense has on the return on assets. And so you can see that as interest expense increases, what happens is the, the return on assets decreases. Now, this is what we refer to as the minimum return expected by the board from this organization. This is like, this is the list we should actually make. And that means that if the company makes say a return of 4%, it may actually breach quite a number of things, including debt covenants. And it, this, this would be detrimental to the organization. So this is not just a desired return. This is the minimum return before things go bad. You'll also have the expected return, and then you'll have the bonus level, and that's the bonus level up there. So obviously, as you can see, if the interest expense is low, then the company is able to generate more return on assets. So you can see how this variable borrowing rate is actually having an impact on profitability or on return. Now, this is a quiz for you. Golden Kernel is located in an area that is prone to infrequent bushfires. Despite investing heavily in fire suppressant infrastructure, fire in the fields would devastate crops and soil. And so the question here is, where on the likelihood and consequence graph would you expect the risk of a fire to be most appropriately plotted? So I want you to take a minute, have a look at this, and see whether you can plot this uh, risk correctly. Is it under A, is it B, is it D, or C? Now, if you've done this correctly, it should ideally be A. Why is it A? We are told here that uh, these bushfires are quite infrequent, which means the likelihood is very low. But if it occurs, we uh, the question says that it would devastate crops and soil. So the impact would be quite high. And that's why the consequence is high. And that's why A is the correct answer there. Now, if you were to draw a risk um, appetite line or risk appetite um, prioritization here, you will see that you could draw it anywhere. So if it is there, for example, you'll see that anything that's above this line is what is considered to be unacceptable. In this case, C would be unacceptable. Uh, A and D are on the borderline, and then B is acceptable. So the organization will probably not do much when it comes to B. It will say, just monitor it. Don't spend too much time on it. Now, remember, you could also shift this uh, 
risk appetite line. So instead of having it uh, as that red line, it could also shift. And if that happens, then D now falls below that risk appetite uh, line. And so that becomes now acceptable. C is obviously still unacceptable, but can you see now A is clearly unacceptable. It needs to be lowered. So you need to have mechanisms in place to lower this risk to an acceptable uh, level. Now, this is a, a very good example of how you can have this line. And so in this case, it's drawn there. And so you can see anything that is high or extreme is, uh, is unacceptable. Anything that is medium or low is acceptable. Now, medium, anything that falls within that um, these boxes here is on the borderline. And remember, we are looking at consequence and likelihood. Now, remember, when something is extreme, this is has a very significant impact on the business. Uh, you will find that chances are the likelihood will be high and the consequence, the consequence will also be high. And that's why that tends to be extreme. Now we have a short video on this, so you can, you can watch that. Let's now look at risk treatment. Now risk treatment is all about putting mechanisms in place to manage or mitigate that risk. Now let's continue with this quiz. Gold, Golden Kinels holds an insurance contract with a large insurance company. In terms of this contract, GK can claim for the cost of any corn plantations that might destroy um, crops. This insurance contract is an example of which type of risk treatment. Now remember, fire here, hazard is a risk. And what this company has done is it's taken insurance. So what type of risk management um, approach has the organization taken? So the correct answer here is pass it on. So the organization has passed on the risk to an insurance company or to another party, a third party, and is basically paying a premium on that. And so if that risk eventuates or, or materializes, the organization will be compensated for that risk. So the organization is not directly managing that risk, either using its own tools or using its own employees or controls. So we are saying passing the risk to a third party for an upfront premium can be referred to, it. That's, that's passing it on. That's essentially a risk treatment approach and that's passing it on. Now, it's arguable that we have changed the consequence, noting that the underlying damage would be unchanged. Now, let's face it. If a fire occurs in this particular case, the damage will still be the same. So you, if the, the consequence of the fire is still, if it's, say, $5 million, it's still $5 million. And so we, ha we you might, yes, we have changed the consequence to the organization, but we haven't really changed the consequence of the risk. So that's just something for you to think about. So what are the ways you can treat risk or manage risk? You can retain that risk. Now, remember, when we were looking at SIC Limited, SIC clearly outlines in, it, in, in its risk framework that it takes considered risks. That's because organizations can't completely avoid risks. It's part of doing business. And so retaining risk can either be because that risk is quite low, so they accept that risk, or there is nothing they can do about it. And so those two, that's, that's when an organization would accept or retain a risk. What else could it do? It could completely remove the source of that risk. How could you do this? So if an organization, for example, has a variable rate borrowing, it, it can approach the bank and, and negotiate for a fixed rate borrowing. By doing that, it has eliminated the, the, the interest rate risk, that variable rate change that could impact on profitability, and that's called removing the source. Can an organization change the likelihood of a risk? Very unlikely, probably not possible because the likelihood is a likelihood. Is what's a, what, what, is, what is the likelihood that this particular risk will materialize? What's the likelihood that uh, cyber attackers will attack the organization? There's very little you can do about stopping cyber attackers from attacking the organization, but you can prevent them from accessing data. Can you change the consequence? Yes. So you can use derivatives, you can use controls, and this will, will, will minimize the impact to that particular organization. 
And then, like we said, when it comes to insurance, you could potentially pass on that risk to a third party. Now, figure 1.14 is an interesting one, and it shows the different ways an organization can manage risks. Now, when we say no hedge, it means it has chosen to retain this risk or to accept this risk. That essentially means it's doing nothing about it. This tends to happen when the organization is either uh, far exceeding its, uh, its earnings guidance, and so it's making more money than it's expected. And so it's not so worried about um, any variability or volatility in that interest rate. And so it will say, you know, let, let things fall where they may. We will manage that. The other one is taking a 100% hedge. And you can see from this that if you take a 100% hedge on a variable rate borrowing, it means that the interest rate, rate will always remain 4%. And that's why you can see that there's no, there's no real change in this because you have hedged 100% of it, you expect that it will be 4%. Now you could choose to hedge 50% of the loan. So for example, if the principal amount is uh, 500,000, you could choose to hedge to 50,000 and you could choose to fix the interest rate and you could leave the other 50% uh, the, the, the uh, as variable. Or rather you might, not, you might choose not to hedge it, uh, say using a swap in this case. If you do that, what will happen is you will find that the, obviously the impact to the organization is less, but at the same time, you can see that uh, because of that, what's happening is the occurrences are very close to the mean. Yeah, because 50% is hedged, it's just 50% that is uh, that is not hedged. Then you can use a caller. Now, a caller is very interesting because you protect um, the, uh, the risk. So for example, if you're very concerned about rising interest uh, rates, so you would put a, um, um, an option, and that's called a cap, to, to protect against that. So if, if, uh, if the interest rate is higher than the cap, then you exercise the option. And then you could also put a flow option. And so the flow option is essentially, if the, if the interest rate falls below that flow option, then essentially what you'll do is you'll pay the other uh, party. And so the interest rate will always fall between those two. Now, don't worry about swaps so much. This is going to be comprehensively covered in this subject. And so for now, just understand that uh, you can use swaps, you can use uh, callers, uh, you can use options uh, to, to, to hedge against this, um, these risks. So you can use an option. And an option basically just protects against um, you know, the, the interest rates rising above a certain point. So you will continue to be exposed and up to a certain uh, point. Now let's go back to CBA. Now with uh, with CBA, CBA or Commonwealth Bank identifies its material risks. Now some of these are credit risk, and I've taken an example here of credit risk, and it's essentially saying that credit risk is a potential for loss arising from the failure of a counterparty to meet their contractual obligations to the group. Now look at what the the bank has as part of those controls or measures to treat this risk. It has defined credit risk indicators. It only transacts with counterparties that demonstrate their ability and willingness to service their obligations. And so it, it will not um, give loans to, to customers with low credit ratings and the like. And uh, you can also see that there is regular monitoring of credit rating, there is stress testing and the like. So these are measures and controls that you can put in place to manage a particular risk. Uh, this one here is market risk, which is the fact that market rates and prices can change over time. Remember those interest rate risk, foreign exchange movements and the like. And again, the bank has quite a number of controls to manage uh, this particular risk. It has a defined market risk indicator, which assesses that. Uh, it has minimal appetite for proprietary trading. It has pricing. It has... Um, back testing of value at risk models against hypothetical profit and loss it manages its balance sheet it monitors its residual value risk exposures and the like so this is commonwealth bank saying to the investors look we know we have these risks but it's not like we are doing nothing about it we have measures in place and remember they also have policies and committees in place to actively manage these risks we have monitoring and review, which is also a very, very important um, part of the process. And this is really making sure that uh, the, the risk management process is working as intended. 
and continues to be tailored to the organization. So you will find some organizations will expand. So you might find that an organization had a, a market capitalization of say um, 300 million. And then you find that it might get to 500 million and the like. So what happens is if the market capitalization doubles, the risk team should ensure that the consequence table, as an example, has been tailored to that particular organization. So monitoring and review is very, very important. It's also important to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do. So if, uh, if say, the IT director promised the board that there are certain controls that will be put in place, you'll find that the internal audit team, as an example, might perform a review of that to ensure that those controls have now been put in place and whether they're effective. Communication and consultation needs to happen all at, across all levels. So remember, risk management is the responsibility of all employees. So you can watch that video, a uh, short video on the risk management framework. Let's now look at the level of sophistication. One thing I want to mention about risk frameworks is if you are not careful, management can see it as a, as a burden or a compliance uh, burden. And so you have to be very careful that it actually adds value to the organization. And so this is the dance that uh, a risk manager has to make sure that they get right. This is the balance they have to make sure that they get right. Because if they make it very administrative, then it becomes a box ticking exercise and has no value. Now, what I've seen with very experienced risk managers, what they do is they, they when, when it comes to talking to the executives, they generally just uh, organize a, you know, a coffee, a coffee meeting, have a, uh, a meeting with the, with the, say, the CEO, have a chat about the business, ask the CEO what is keeping them awake at night. And then the CEO would, would talk about it and say, hey, we are very worried that the government might change the tax rate and the like. That is how ideally an experienced risk manager would approach it. And then the, the, the risk manager would potentially give ideas or thoughts or might actually bring the team together through the, 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 the risk register so that they can work together. So he might uh, go back to the task, ta tax team and say, you know, the CEO is very concerned about this risk. What do we have in place to manage this? And so they would document that and that could potentially go back to the CEO, to the executives. And that gives the CEO assurance. Oh, I'm, I was worried about this, but it looks like my organization has controls. Or I was worried about this, but look, as much as we don't have controls, this has now been brought uh, on the forefront of people's thoughts and uh, something is being done about it. So this is very, very important to ensure that, you know, you don't just send uh, risk registers to everybody and say, fill these risk registers, send them to me. Uh, that becomes very, very administrative. Now, this is an example of a risk matrix and some of the things that need to be included there. So you need to describe the risk. Who is the risk owner? What is the rating pre-controls? Now, remember, before you put in place controls, there will be that, uh, what we call inherent risk. And so in this case, it's extreme. Now, after implementing controls, there is what we refer to as resi residual risk. And the, in this case, it's moderate. Now, in this organization, what they do is how do they monitor or manage foreign exchange? Well, they, they hedge in line with the treasury policy. Let's now look at this quiz. Which of the following is a factor to be considered when developing a risk framework? So is it the board composition? Is it the size of the organization? Is it controls? Now, remember, more than one could apply. So make sure that you answer. So if you think it's three of them, if you think it's two of them, uh, just make sure you select all the answers that apply. So the correct answer there is the size of the organization and the industry. The, the risk framework, as an example, for financial institutions will be very different to the risk framework for a mining company. So you need to make sure that that is tailored to that industry. Again, as I said, it's very important to also make sure that it fits the size of that particular organization. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. Thank you.